Good evening, Shiloh. We welcome you once again to a study in the Word of God. I am so grateful to our Lord that He has given me the privilege to come before you one more time as we um, spend time looking at uh, God's truth and considering Him, um, and considering rather His Word to us uh, on today. Thank the Lord for. Um, for each and every one of you. I'm grateful to the Lord that you have chosen to take the moment and come along as we um, look into God's Word together. I appreciate you, Shiloh, and thank the Lord for how faithful He has been to us during this whole pandemic uh, season. Um, he has proven Himself over and over again. Uh, we thank the Lord for, uh, for that. Um, we're continuing to solicit your prayers for the members of, uh, of our fellowship, uh, both those who are experiencing difficulties, those who have lost family members during this time, and those who um, have family members who uh, are going through illnesses. And so we want to uh, let you know that God is still on the throne, that your church family is thinking about you and that we are praying for you and believing God um, for his, um, his uh, being with you during this time. Um, I uh, am also uh, going to encourage you on today to remember um, our prayer time on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Um, we invite the church family to come along uh, and go with us um, and uh, be a part of that uh, prayer uh, prayer gathering. Um, I am uh, grateful to the Lord for uh, our beloved sister Jackie White and um, our beloved Deaconess Gray for their commitment um, to give leadership to our prayer ministry and um, I'm also grateful to the Lord for all of you, um, our membership, who has chosen to join along with us, uh, both uh, by becoming a member of the prayer ministry um, uh, and then also joining on Saturday mornings as we, um, as we come together. I want you to know that it means a lot. Um, it's important. Uh, Satan attacks the prayer life of the Christian um, largely due to the fact that he knows the power of prayer. He knows what it does. Um, you, you don't know how awesome um, your life can be um, until you have a prayer covering. Um, you don't you don't know what you're missing. Um, the the truth of the matter is is that a number of us who have been uh, around church for a few years, um, you know, being dragged to church by parents and grandparents, aunties or whatever that took us in, uncles that took us um, and made us sit through services all those uh, years ago. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that you were made better for it, not simply because you were present in the sanctuary, but largely due to the fact that um, those same people were praying for you. And even though they are gone, um, their prayers live on. God watches over their prayer requests, and you and I are... Uh, the beneficiaries of um, faithful men and women, some we know, others we may not even know, um, who have called our names personally and individually um, uh, before the presence of the Lord. And we are now here um, because somebody prayed for us. And I want to encourage you um, I am, I am encouraging you to be a, 
available, make yourself available um, to be a part of that prayer gathering. It's it's wonderful. It's amazing um, what God is doing um, in the lives of his people just by us coming together. So I want you to know that you want to do that. Um, there's a commitment from heaven that if two or three would gather in his name, there he'll be in the midst. That's all I'm saying. So you be mindful. 7 a.m. Um, is our prayer time on Saturday mornings. So come along with us as we seek the face of, of God. Uh, also, I want to um, just encourage you um, to um, continue to give as you have been doing. You've been absolutely fantastic in your giving, and so we encourage you to do that. Keep um, keep the church in mind, um, and uh, know that um, you reap what you sow. And I'm sure that a number of you are experiencing some blessings now um, that pardon me that have come almost pardon me out of nowhere so to speak um, because God honors his uh, his word and when you meet him in um, in his word in a specific area when you meet him there God is faithful in that area to do some wonderful things um, in your life. He will do some things in your life. So I want to encourage you to, to give and continue to do so and thank you for what you've already what you've already done. God bless you, Shiloh. I appreciate you and I love you. And I want to once again say I miss you. I miss you. I really do. Now, uh, we began a little while ago to do a study on the Holy Spirit. We wanted to continue um, talking about that. Last week, we um, took a turn and we began to deal with uh, this idea of relationship in light of the Godhead. And um, what I want to do is uh, continue this uh, evening with that um, um, idea, okay? So we talked last week about the reality of the Godhead is shown. We considered that last week. The reality of the Godhead is shown, and that is shown in the in the text of, of the scripture. It is shown. Um, but then secondly, and for our purposes uh, this evening, the role of the Godhead in salvation, the role of the Godhead in salvation. Um, turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. As you're turning, let's pray. I don't know if we prayed already, but we're going to do it. If we have done it, we're going to do it again. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the power that is found in your word. Unlock for us the truth that's found here. Speak life to our hearts, souls, minds. And we'll be careful to give you praise for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Ephesians chapter 1. And we want to um, look at verses 3 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Um, and in that section, uh, you can read it at home. In that section, the Apostle Paul is beginning to uh, deal with, under the direction of the Spirit of God, he's beginning to deal with this idea 
of redemption and what that means um, from the God side of the uh, conversation, um, from the God side of the act of redemption. Um, and what he really wants to do is he is going to um, deal with the church at Ephesus and begin to address the issues that are reflected as it relates to their responsibilities um, for being redeemed and all that kind of thing. But he lays a brilliant foundation for that um, in uh, beginning in verse in chapter uh, one, uh, beginning at verse three. The uh, the idea is that what he what he's what he's doing is he is um, preparing them he is preparing them for what um, their uh, what their responsibility in the world um, is is supposed to be in, in other words uh, this is what redeemed people are supposed to look like right uh, but before he gets there he lays foundationally the reason why you ought to do that, the reason why you ought to be that, the reason why you ought to act like that. And so he um, he begins laying the foundation um, in chapter 1, around verse 3, down to verse 14, dealing with the act of redemption and then the, the God side of that, of that act. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that he um, lays it out, um, again, as the Holy Spirit gives direction, he lays it out so clearly um, for the church, the, the believers, those of us who would read not just, the, not just the Ephesians of the first century, but for those of us who would follow um, them, um, years later, he wants us to understand that the Godhead, the, the, the work of redemption, the work of saving mankind uh, was a joint venture um, in the Godhead. And that every uh, member of the Godhead took part in the saving of men, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? Um, now, the way that it unfolds for us in Ephesians, the way that it kind of, it, it unfolds for us is um, in verses 3 to 6, we have the role of the Father. In verses 7 to 12, the role of the Son. And in verses 13 and 14, we have the role of the Spirit. All right? We have Father, Son, Holy Spirit as um, joint members of the Godhead. All right? And they are joined together in the act of redemption, in the act of redemption, they are literally joined, they're joined together. Now, um, here's, the, here's the issue, and this is important, very important. Um, what Paul says is that we are saved because every single member of the Godhead is active in the work of redemption. Every single member of the Godhead is active in the work of redemption. Very important. 
I'm going to say it again because it is, it is critical that we understand this. Every member of the Godhead is involved in the work of redemption. Verses 3 to 6, Paul tells us that God the Father planned our salvation. In verses 7 to 12, we are told that God the Son purchased our salvation. In verses 13 and 14, we are told that the Holy Spirit provides our salvation. Verses 3 to 6, God the Father planned it. Verses 7 to 12, God the Son purchased it. Verses 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit provides it. Now, for our study purposes, so that we might uh, kind of flow evenly through this, um, these uh, sections, there are three of them, uh, they kind of kind of flow evenly and um, they all three um, kind of unfold for us pretty much the same way so we're going to be using the exact same outline as we move through each section um, each section begins with a declaration and then we're given some details and then thirdly, we're told about a desire. And each one flows evenly uh, through those three things. First, there's a declaration. And then we're given some details. And then each one closes with a desire. And uh, we'll talk about them as we move through our study. First of all, let's look at verses 3 to 6. I want to spend some time over the next couple of weeks with these. Um, and I don't want to rush because of where we're headed. And uh, the good news is, is that we don't have to. We can take our time. Um, I don't want to bore you with the truth, but I, I, my goal and my heart's desire is for us to finally grasp what's here and understand the magnitude of the love and the mercy and the uh, grace, benevolence, the benevolence of, of the great God who has saved us. All right. Um, so we begin with the work of God the Father, and that is, He planned our salvation. He planned it. The first of all, there's a declaration. Let's look at the declaration. Number one, it says in verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That, beloved, is a declaration. That's some kind of, of uh, declaration. And uh, we thank the Lord uh, that uh, we know now some things. And what we know is that God the Father has started something. He, he started something. He, he blessed us with all spiritual blessings 
watch this, in heavenly places in Christ. That's powerful. He blessed us uh, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's wonderful. So that's that's the declaration. The Apostle Paul says that we ought to speak well, say something good um, about God the Father. And uh, the reason why we ought to say something good about him is because of what he's done. And uh, what he's done is blessed us with all spiritual blessings. That's the declaration. But now, the details. What do you mean he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings? What exactly are we talking about? Let's see. Verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him. Now, I need you to know, um, and of course, um, all Shilohites know this already. Uh, these verses are loaded. I mean, loaded, loaded, loaded. You, you, I mean, it would take us years to finish this, uh, but we're not going to do that to you. I'm not going to do that to you, but I mean, absolutely, it's mind-boggling how much truth God can lay out in just a few verses. And that's exactly what he's done here um, in helping us understand um, just how much he cares for us and uh, to kind of show us um, his work on our on our behalf, right? So the first thing that Paul says is in, 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 uh, in this section, he says um, that God the Father watch, has chosen us. Literally, beloved, um, that's what they call election. The idea is, is that he chose us. Not the other way around. He chose us. And uh, that's important. You want to stick a pen in that because that's we're going to come back to that in just a minute. He chose us. Um, and then the verse goes on to say, and he chose us in him. This is one of the Apostle Paul's favorite um, phrases. Uh, and um, it's, it's actually it's literally speaking of location. Um, the idea is that we are literally, locationally, in Christ. That's a, another study for another day that we're not going to spend a lot of time with here on uh, on this evening. But I will tell you that um, you and I are no longer um, in the same state or the same position um, that we were. Uh, we are now locationally, personally, in Christ. And uh, that's a very important uh, truth to grab a hold of. Um, the real, or rather I should say the full idea, is that we, um, uh, we find our identities now, our identification in Christ. Um, and that's, that's critical. Um, um, it is essential for us to grab a hold of that because it literally um, lays a hold of, uh, you know, value, the issue of value, uh, self-worth, and all of that. Um, we, uh, our value is seen by the fact that the one who created us um, and and knows us right um, has chosen us and God's view of us 
ought to give us some sense of how valuable we are. Um, it is important that we grab a hold of that because you, you can't get a, um, the, the, the level um, of, um, of value that you need um, or rather I should say you can't get a sense of your value um, and how high that how high how high that value is from anyone um, greater than God himself he chose you he chose me and he chose you and I because he valued us. He put value on us. And um, he chose us in him. Um, he chose us in the object of his own love. And by virtue of our being in him, we are now being loved as he loves the object of his full love, who is Christ himself. So he loves us now the way he loved Christ, the way he loves Christ, he, he loves us. That's value. But get a hold of this. Watch. Verse 4. He says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Um, now, if we follow this chronologically, if you will, then what this verse means is that Ephesians 1, 4 predates Genesis 1, 1. The idea is, is that God did this before he did that. So before God created anything, he had already chosen us in Christ. Lord have mercy. We were already in Christ before the world began. Now, why? Why did he do that? It's in verse 4. That we should be holy and without blame before him. The idea is that Adam's failure in the garden was no surprise to God. And our salvation was not an afterthought. God already knew that Adam was going to fail. And in preparation for failure... God selected out of mankind, out of Adam's family, those who he wanted for himself. And he chose us before Adam fell to secure our salvation and that personal relationship. All right? Now, he fixed it so we could not be lost by choosing us before anyone was lost. We are right now in Christ Jesus. And because of that position in him, we are safe and 
secure. Verse 5. He goes on. Talking about the details. The details now. He says in verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. The idea is, is that God has already... Um, He's chosen us for himself, right? And he's chosen us for himself that we'd be in a state of holiness and without blame, right? And he did that for his own purpose, for his own glory, because what he planned is to adopt us officially into the family. And the official adoption is yet to come. Um, but here's the idea. Um, he's chosen us unto the adoption of children. So the idea is, is that we are already his children. We're already his. We already belong to him. But it is the official adoption, um, the official renaming, if you will. Um, and the idea is, is that he has predetermined that's where we're going to be. So Technically speaking, it doesn't matter what happens to you. It doesn't matter what goes what goes down in your life. It doesn't matter how many bumps and how many snags and how many dips and how many twists your life may take. If you were chosen before the foundation of the world, God made that choice of you for himself then the reality is, is that he is literally going to make sure you end up exactly where he wants you to be. Look at this, verse 5. According to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, the reason why he's done all of that is he did it for the good pleasure of his own will. According to the good pleasure of of his will according to that which pleases him god the father did it according to that which pleases him verse six the desire what exactly is the desire for all of this what's what what does he want was he looking for here it is to the praise of of the glory of his grace. The idea is, is that God the Father laid out all of this for the express purpose of his own will, his own glory, and all of that. But the reality is, is that he is, he's done all of this to create an atmosphere for his own praise, for his own worship. He did all of this so that ultimately there would be some thanksgiving and some appreciation from those who were the recipients of these spiritual blessings. Right? Look at this. Verse 6, he says, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The idea is, is that we worship him because he has in Jesus, and because of Jesus, he has accepted us. Us. Messed up, backward, wrong, picky, finicky, strange, weird, backward, us. And in spite of who and what we are in terms of our own human inadequacies. God the Father knowing all about that and all about us said, I want this individual, this person, or these people for myself. The only thing that I can think of that I can do about that personally is to say thank you. And I thank you because I know for certain I could have, nor would I have, done any of those things for myself. 
as a response to what God the Father has done for us. His desire is that we would turn around and say thank you. Look at where we are. In fact, in light of our relationship to Jesus Christ, beloved, look at who we are. So God the Father planned our salvation, and he planned our salvation so that at the end of the story, he might hear from our lips words of appreciation and thanksgiving for the marvelous and wonderful things that he has done. Beloved, what a mighty God we serve. And I want to argue, or at least begin to argue, that he is worthy of our praise. We'll go to the work of the Son next week. I want to stop here and th just thank God for what he, the Father, has done. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful privilege that you've given to us to be your children. And we're grateful that in a place and a time that we could not see, in fact, we didn't even realize or was even in existence, you chose us for yourself. What a glorious Father you are. Thank you, Father, for being so good to us, for showing us how much you value us. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. Touch the hearts of the listeners. Cause us all to show appreciation to you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Shiloh. We thank the Lord again for each and every one of you. We're trusting the Lord for your health and well-being. Please stay safe. Follow all of the uh, necessary COVID uh, guidelines. Um, and um, we look forward to sharing with you and being with you next time. Be encouraged. I love you, and God knows I miss you. Bye-bye. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise Shalom, Lord. what's going on? On behalf of Epic, Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Right the corner. Basically, what we're trying to do is rather than doing baskets due to the pandemic, we're actually going to be collecting our gift cards, basically. So what we're asking is for donations. Uh, roughly, we're doing $40. If you can't do $40, it's okay. Whatever, whatever you want to donate, please give it to us, all right? You know, and we love you guys so much. Thank you for your support.